For some time, I've wanted to try making pots that have very trimmed interiors, with sharp lips, ledges, and sections the glaze can pull into. It's something usually seen only on the outside of my work, and so I made a number of bowls like this, with walls thick enough in some areas so they could be trimmed to my liking, in a way that causes the glaze to interact in an interesting way. So often, as I was taught to throw in trim pots, the notion of trimming the inside of your vessels was seen as a sign of incompetence, as why would you trim somewhere that you should have finalised during the throwing process? And well, I understand where they're coming from, as if you were to trim the inside of every mug you made, or every bowl, then overall it would end up adding a lot of extra time to your making process, but I still sometimes end up doing it. The problem with this idea is that it leads some people into thinking that if somebody trims the insides of their pots, then they aren't a very good thrower, potter, or ceramicist, and it's a ludicrous notion. Anyway, these are the tools I use. There's a mixture of steel trimmers and tungsten carbide turners, and these are my hand-carved porcelain maker's marks for stamping my pots, and a seldom used razor blade, which I sometimes use for trimming if I want a really sharp, straight edge. And finally, there are the spinners. I only use these tools during the turning stage. They're placed on top of pots and I push down through them to secure the pot down as I turn it. There's a ball bearing between the black and white part, which means you hold a stationary component whilst the other part spins, and I found they help to keep pots pinned down more consistently. Here's a heavier metal prototype I was sent by Richard. He's the engineer and potter who makes and sells them, and I'll include a link to his Instagram account down in the description below. Now, this one isn't made by Richard. This was the first spinner I started using, a metal component salvaged from the swivelling stand of an old iMac computer, which does more or less the same job, although with no rotating parts, it isn't nearly so comfortable to use. And so, the trimming of the interior surface can begin. I start by defining the first step on the upper section of the wall, trimming the walls as flat as I can, and defining the shape so any lips or edges are much sharper than they were, as ultimately I want the glaze to catch on them like it does here. The glaze flows down the wall and sits on this ledge, where it intensifies in colour, and that's exactly what I want it to do on this uppermost portion of the pot. Typically speaking, my glazes tend to soften any form they're placed onto. It's why, at this stage, I make everything as crisp as it can be, as if my trimming wasn't so refined, the glazes that are eventually coated over the clay wouldn't really do anything interesting. Trimming like this with the tool held upright is a relatively tricky task, and the blade feels like it constantly wants to be snagged and drawn around with the bowl, which is why I place a finger on the blade itself to keep it steady. Next I really have to tackle the rim, at the moment it's far too square and bulky, which, visually, makes the form feel much heavier than the pot actually is. So I start by turning it flat, and then I'll bevel this edge to a sharp point, which means the glaze will break more dramatically over it, revealing a brown, almost metallic colour as the iron-rich clay burns through. Turning the rim is always a delicate moment, as it's extraordinarily easy for the blade to catch and gouge a much larger chunk away from the rim than you'd want, which could either destroy your pot entirely, or, if you're able to rectify the mistake by trimming the rim down, you could end up with a shape that's entirely different from what you set out to achieve. And so, when I trim this area, I hold the turning tool tightly, with both hands, keeping it as steady as it can be. I then use the edge of a plastic kidney just to smooth over this area, as I want this sharp edge to flow outward, without too many marks left over from the turning tools. I'll even burnish around the rim, just to smooth it slightly. Following this, I can start turning the walls beneath the step, and here, you'll begin to notice the most annoying factor about trimming the inside of a vessel, and that's tidying up all the trimmings that accumulate inside. I simply use my hand to get rid of most of them, but I won't worry about removing every single last piece until it's almost finished. But when so many gather that you can barely see what you're doing, then they of course need to be dealt with. What I've come to use to remove all those tiny burrs of clay is just a piece of soft clay fresh from the bag. I simply glide it over the interior form, and after a few passes, all those tiny specks will stick to it. And now for the last section of the interior, I want to turn the base so there's a more defined area into which the glaze will be able to settle. So it pools like this, into a thick 
flat layer of glaze that intensifies in colour and crackles nicely. And with the interior trimmed, the shape sharpened and the walls slightly thinned, I can move on to turning the underside of the pot. But first, with the bowl still stuck down to the wheel, I'll trim this portion closest to the rim using a turning tool with a long, flat blade to ensure that it's perfectly straight, which is something I couldn't quite do if the bowl was upturned and the rim was touching the wheel head. As this is such an open form, I can place my left hand opposite where the turning tool is working. This way I can feel the cross section constantly and I can gauge the thickness of the walls with much more accuracy than normal. And as I trim, I'm just following the inside form without making it too thin as a large open form like this fired to the temperatures I'll take it may be prone to warping a tiny bit if it is trimmed too finely. To scrape over the chattering marks left by that tungsten carbide turning tool, I use the flat edge of a metal kidney just to scrape over them. This flattens the very slight repetitive texture you may have seen before this. Now to access the underside fully, I have to slice the bowl off the wheel as it had been stuck down with slip. As this is a relatively wide shape, which I'll be turning quite thin, I don't want to handle it badly. So I place a board on the rim to keep it nice and flat and flip it over like this. I'll center it on this board and I should be able to trim it just like this, as the pot is low and wide and there's still some heft in the walls and the foot to weigh it down. I then secure the MDF bat in place with three little lumps of soft clay. A spinner tool is then placed on top, through which I'll apply downward pressure so the pot stays in place. I then use a very small turning tool to do some more detailed trimming, particularly underneath this ledge, squaring off the corner just like I did on the inside. For the lower half of the walls, I can switch to some bigger, beefier blades, as the clay is thicker here and I don't need to be so careful about removing it, and to make sure I trim with as much control as possible, I grip the tool close to the blade and link both my right and left hands by making contact with them. This can be just via my thumbs touching. Whatever it is, it adds stability to my movements, which helps to keep the blade steady as it slices through the clay and through any undulations without them affecting the blade's movement. The fingers of my left hand are pushing through the spinner on top, and once again you can see my thumb just making contact with my index finger, a bridge between the two to add stability as ultimately my right hand is floating in space with very little to brace against. And once trimmed mostly straight, I use this razor's edge just to make sure this entire expanse is actually flat. If you're turning a slightly grogged clay body, which means one that's slightly textured, quite often sharp specks will be caught by the blade and they'll be dragged around the shape, resulting in some unpleasant lines being scored into the surface. And to remove those, I'll carefully burnish the surface with a slightly softer edge, and I make sure no specks of sand are caught by the blade, which would otherwise be dragged around, marking the clay. The last portion to turn is the foot. I want these bowls to sit on quite a tall pedestal of clay, so I trim the outer edge to be a bit straighter, and then I can work on the actual base itself. There are so many ways you can turn the bottom of a pot, but for this piece I'll keep it relatively simple. I begin by turning it flat and removing any marks left over from when the piece was wired off the wheel during the throwing process. A pot's foot might be my favourite part to trim on any vessel I make. Whilst as much of the walls and the interior surface are going to be covered in glaze, the foot almost always remains as bare clay, which means I can be a lot more careful to some degree about how I choose to finish it. What I mean by that is that because the walls are going to be covered in glaze, I can leave them to some degree slightly scruffy, as the thick layers of glass that eventually coat them will hide 99% of any maker's marks left on their surfaces, unless they're very prominent. Whereas, on the foot, that isn't the case. And I like the fact that if somebody takes one of my pots and turns them upside down, they'll find a base that's really as carefully finished as the rest of the vessel. As I could feel that the base was quite thick, I remove some mass from the bottom in a number of passes, removing the stoneware layer by layer. And the joy of trimming the outside of a pot is that all the trimmings simply fall away into the wheel's plastic tray, instead of gathering into the middle of the bowl, like earlier in this video. 
As I trim, I check the thickness by very carefully pressing down with my thumb, and if I feel like this expanse bows inward, I know that the base is thin enough and I need to stop trimming. And as this isn't a shape I'm acquainted with, like my medium bowls for instance, I do take everything a lot more slowly, and I'm not nearly as gung-ho with my trimming as I am with those. Once the circular foot has been formed, I gently scrape over these two facets to make sure they're perfectly flat and smooth. I also slightly burnish these edges and run my fingertips over the sharpest points, just to take the edge off them. And lastly, I stamp the pot with my maker's mark. After flipping the pot around and feeling the cross section one last time, I felt like there was just slightly more clay I could remove from the underside. So I spent a further few minutes refining the shape and getting the pot's weight to a point of balance. And as the vessel has been sitting on its rim for the past 10 minutes, I give it one last burnish. And that's the pot finished for the time being. From this point, I'll let it slowly turn bone dry over a few days. Then it can be bisque fired in an electric kiln to 1000 degrees Celsius. Then it'll be waxed and glazed and finally reduction fired to 1290 degrees Celsius. But I'll record all that and hopefully I'll be able to make an updated video at some point in the future. Until then, thank you so much for watching. And like always, I'll see you next week.